Welcome to the ultimate cycling training camp with Team EF Coaching in Girona. I am your host, Charles Wimet, an high-level amateur cyclist and YouTuber who's always looking for the extra edge to elevate my cycling abilities. For six days in a row, follow a group of eight amateur cyclists with two world-class coaches as we embark on this experience of a lifetime where the group and I will test our physical and mental limits all for common goals to become better cyclists. What did we learn during this training camp? Did I become faster? Ah, we're all good! Yeah! Welcome to Team Camp, Charles. Find out by yourself and experience this training camp firsthand with me exclusively on my YouTube channel. Coming up next in episode number four. This is uh, a really important slide. For whatever reason, human beings, when they get on a bike, turn it into an extension of the Stairmaster. I realize I may be that Stairmaster cyclist. So many free watts there for 99% of people that ride bikes. That's actually not how you do a pedal strip. That's not how you stand up on your bike. And yes, aerodynamics matter. Well, if you want to have be really efficient at 100 RPM and you also want to be really efficient at, let's say, 65, you have to do work at both ends of the cadence spectrum. On that first set, because I've done it wrong or it's because I've never worked with my butt out? I mean, I would say probably some of both, right? Because you're, you're working on rotating the fellows forward. Yeah. If I'm here, my pelvis is tucked. What's required for me to rotate my pelvis forward? Right, way back building your jail team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is Jonathan Vauters, AKA JV, the founder and CEO of Team EF Pro Cycling. And he gave us this exclusive seminar. Hey guys, before starting day four, I just want to take a quick moment to tell you about the foundation program from Team EF Coaching. This program is a cost-effective way to get faster and to get in shape. You won't have a dedicated coach, but you're gonna have access to this exclusive platform that gives you really thought on and really well-built workouts by some of the best coaches in the world. You guys should definitely check out my in-depth review on my YouTube channel. The link will be in the description down below. And if you wanna test out the foundation program, you can get started with two months for the price of one using the code Charles. All right, let's get into day four of the Team EF Coaching Training Camp in Girona. What about you, Charles? One to ten. About one is fucked. Completely fucked. Ten is I'm nine. You're good. Yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna revise. <laughs> no, no, you're not. You're, you're not allowed. To, you're like my wife. What are you ordering for dinner? So I know what I can order for dinner. That's not how this works. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's apparently a logarithmic scale. I, I thought it was linear. You are gonna be walking around like, ooh, <laughs> but it's a little sore today. <laughs> so. Overview of the route, we got 88k on deck today. Winds are a little bit up. The profile, we got three big climbs. This is uh, a really important slide. So I don't know if you guys were listening yesterday, um, but even the, and, and, and again, I'm not criticizing anybody for not knowing this, like those pro guys that rode by us yesterday. Um, I, if you were listening to me at Colby, I was like, oh, another Stairmaster cyclist. Like there's guys in the pro peloton, in the world tour peloton, riding their bike like this. For whatever reason, human beings, when they get on a bike, turn it into an extension of the Stairmaster. And when, what do you do when you get on the Stairmaster or when you walk up a set of stairs? You push down with your leg to raise yourself up, right? You can see how this would be, how most people would naturally get on a bike. They think about pushing down, right? So you're looking at the front of your body and you're like, okay, I want to generate force. So I'm going to press into this thing. But that's actually not how you do a pedal stroke. That's not how you stand up on your bike. The key things that make this position really inefficient are you're straight up and down. So you're catching, you're like a sail out there. You're like, let me catch all the wing possible. Let me try to slow myself down, right? You're not getting any leverage on your bike at all. You do their stand up on their bike, their arms go like this. And so like, <clears throat> just give me an example. Put your arm out straight, right? and try to, try to resist my hand from pushing you down, all right? Now put your arm like this and try to resist way more strength, 
way more strength, right? There's no discussion. If my arms are here, I've got way more leverage into my core than if they're all the way extended out. So how am I gonna generate more power into my pedal stroke? Like this or like this? We have to bend our arms. Not only are you getting more leverage, but see in the next examples, is way more aerodynamic. And yes, aerodynamics matter on well. Especially if you're more of a muscular system dominant athlete like myself. I mean, you guys haven't ridden with me very much, but like when I play cycling in Columbia, I, those guys climb really fast. And then you guys probably have gotten us, I'm not the smallest person on the planet. And like, I gotta stay on the, on, on, up with them on the climbs, right? So from a technical perspective, I have to be so efficient to ride the climbs. And the benefit muscular dominant athletes have is we can transition really well if you train it between cardiovascular system dominance and muscular system dominance. So what does that mean? It means that if I understand my body position and my cadence, I can use a standing body position and a low cadence to bring my heart rate down 10 beats, even at the same power, right? Now, eventually you run out of options. If the base is too high and everybody cracks, right? But this is a tool that most people can use all the time, right? But you have to be efficient in the standing position because if I, if I were to stand up with lower RPM and just use my quads and press down, well, I'm gonna burn my quads out super fast. By getting good at this position, you increase your arsenal of tools that you have in cycling, right? Now you have more options, right? Before this, your option was go as hard as you can up the climb. Well, now it's, I'm gonna go hard, but if I run into trouble, I can use this little strategy here to bring my heart rate down 10 beats, clear some lactate, mm -hmm. right? and get back to the high cadence. After this seminar this morning and after some feedback and looking at videos with Zach, I realized I may be that Stairmaster cyclist. I'm definitely not using my body weight to accelerate uphill when I'm out of the saddle. So I'm gonna work on that today. Maybe I'm gonna gain some, uh, some power, some free power. I'll take that. All right, time to head to the car. Hello, Tito. I'm feeling good. The legs feel great. Thank you. Moving the saddle back a little bit. Ah, thought I was a little bit too much like this. And I need to crouch yes. forward and you need to be more bubble butt. Yes, I need to use my glutes. That's the learning of the day. That's slow enough. Where's the drill? Where's the drill, Freddy? In his home. <laughs> Kobe, you're so aero. Thank you. This is a position. That's why you need to work on your flexibility. That's how you got all your world titles and all of that. You got it. I'm not actually uh, blessed with a lot of VO2 or legs. It's just an arrow shaped butt. <laughs> that was my genetic gift, <laughs> apparently. Everybody's riding their own tempo intervals, right? So you should kind of be doing your own thing. No more than your tempo zones. So I should be able to float around with between everybody. One minute up, pick your own RPM. One minute seated, pick your own RPM. Okay. Okay. So while well, I was gonna point out, like you're driving, just say for the moment, the point of pedal, let's say you're doing a maximal effort over a short hill. So you're pushing down hard, you are pushing down hard on the pedal. What do we have to add up the, the muscle mass? We've got the glute, which is the second largest muscle in the body. We have all the quads, all the hamstrings, all the calves. That's a lot of muscle. So you're pushing down, and then with the arm, the same sided arm, and pulling up. How much muscle do we have? Lateral. It's a lateral, isn't that a great word? Mm -hmm. Same sided. How much muscle mass do we have? We have biceps, which in my case are huge. <laughs> Swole. Right? Bit of tricep and lat, which is the biggest muscle in the body, <laughs> but which has more muscle mass, right? So when we, when we push only with the leg and we don't use our arms properly, we're handicapping a system that's already somewhat imbalanced. But for those moments where you want to maximally accelerate, right? When you're trying to like establish a gap, make separation, sprint for the win, um, rip the peloton in and out, or whatever, or just hang on for dear life over the top of climb. At what gradient is it uh, more efficient to go out of the saddle in, in terms to, to change that load from sitting to standing? I don't, I don't think it's about the grade. It's not about the grade. No? It's about where you are at that moment. It could be, you know, could be a little tiny hill, but you're an hour and a half in and you're just like, oh man, things are a little yeah. tight. I'm still loosening up, whatever. Like I just need to change my body. I need to move it a different way. I'm going to stand up. And then later, 
could be on a steep hill. Sometimes I stay seated on steep stuff. Other times I'm out of the saddle for two minutes at a time. Okay. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but Zach and I are in and out of the saddle like really frequently. All right, so set number one is nine. Not too sure I'm doing the right thing. Zach said bring your hips back. And I got some lower back strain or pain. I don't know, it's not pain, it's just feels like it's muscle. I've never really worked standing standing up out of the saddle, so I guess I don't know if it's good or bad. I'll have to ask Colby. Drop the weight, stop pressing down. Do you like lock the knee up? Like not lock, but Watch. look my leg is straight right here. Okay. Straighter, more up. Yeah, I Jason. Okay, so you're doing a heel down very high. Of course, because I'm dropping my weight. Okay. Right? I was not doing this. Yeah. So about two o'clock, so that's when you bring the heel down. Yeah. Dropping my weight. Okay, I'll try that. Hey guys, are you getting any value out of this YouTube video or series? If you do so, please do not forget to click that subscribe button and leave a thumbs up on this though. It helps a lot more than you can think of. All right, let's get back to it. Key thing here I didn't point out, and this is so key, Colby was talking about this last night, the bowl of soup. Yep. Look at the position of this guy's pelvis. This is how people are riding their bike. They're standing up and they're keeping their pelvis in this position. That's not how you engage your glutes. Right, That's exactly not, like we talked about last night. The hip hinge, the deadlift is the same thing when you stand up, your hips literally go like this. That hip hinge is crucial in the standing position. M mind you, if you're seated, you should already be hinged. But for whatever reason, as soon as everybody stands up on their bike, that hinge goes disappears. Kobe, have a question. Mm. On that first set, I end up with sh not sharp lower back pain, but like strain from changing something. You is that because I've done it wrong, or is it because I've never worked with my butt out? Okay. Or I mean, I would say probably some of both, right? Because you're, you're working on rotating the pelvis forward. Yeah. If you're used to ride, rolling it back. Yeah. Then that lumbar musculature is very stretched. Now you're working forward. Yeah. And you're turning on the probably the superior aspect of the glute, the top part of the glute, and you you feel some discomfort there because the body's like, whoa, I'm not used to using the muscle at this angle. Yeah. Okay. So like anything, you got to be smart. Don't force it. Don't work through acute pain. Yeah. Try some days. Push a little bit to expand your envelope, but. When enough is enough, then be done. Put it down, rest, walk away, come back later. Okay, cool. I feel it here now. Yeah. All right, Zach, so what's the point of the drill we're about to do? So a lot of people don't think about developing different cadence ranges. Well, if you want to have be really efficient at 100 RPM and you also want to be really efficient at, let's say, 65, you have to do work at both ends of the cadence spectrum. And so we're introducing a really wide spectrum transition drill here. We're gonna take people from 50 RPM all the way up to 100. Yep. We're gonna have them switch up and down. And the idea, well, we can't teach everybody everything in one day, but we wanna get them familiar with the spectrum of cadence so that when we go into the next climb, keep in mind on the last one, we worked on body positions, yep. right? This time we're working on cadence transition. So in the last climb, we'll have people working on using the most effective body position and cadences for that climb to get the most speed yeah. for the effort that they're putting out. Crush it. You're a champ. Thanks, buddy. Zach is a champ. <laughs> Papa gels, everybody's Papa gels. You guys, are you, are you tempo? Is tempo? People popping gels. Uh, All right, did everybody learn anything on the first two drills? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah? What did we learn? Use your weight. Use your weight, what else? Yeah. Yeah. Supreme yeah. systems. Between yeah. cardiovascular and muscular system hip dominant, hip right? Like tip the hip. That's good, that's Richard. Tip the hip. Tip the hip. Tip the hip. <coughs> it's hip to be tip. A lot of good stuff that's fresh in your mind, right? The arms. And the arms. So the goal on this next one is really to combine the first two drills so that you can make decisions about every scenario you approach on the climb. What is the best body position and cadence to use in my tempo zone to go as fast as possible? But if you go above your tempo zone, that's not part of the drill. Okay. It's not about going as fast as you possibly can. It's about being as efficient and fast as, and fast as you can be while staying inside <coughs> that tempo zone. Body position and cadence selection will really determine how fast you go up this climb. The ceiling on your tempo zone 
would be as high as I want you to go, right? So if you're, if you're changing gears or hitting a spike, the ceiling on that tempo zone should be the limit. You okay. should always stay a little bit below that ceiling. Okay. This is not a race. This is maximal effort. The only thing I'll say is on the front side of the pedal stroke, if we think about the power phase, if we think of a clock, and we have 12 here at six on the bottom, right? So here's our, here's our clock and here's our dividing line. So front half is the power phase, right? I call it the power phase because humans are meant to run and walk and running and walking is primarily pushing down against the surface of the earth. And we have a lot of muscle that pushes down that extends the hip and knee, not much that brings it up. So that's argument number one as to why we do not want to intentionally pull up on the backside of the stroke. When you pull up on the backside of the stroke, either a lot, either standing or sitting, all you do is hyper facilitate the psoas and it twists your pelvis and causes problems. In my opinion, not everyone will agree with that. Full disclaimer, it's an unpopular opinion. I have many of these. But what we wanna focus on is this phase here. And what the idea is to always produce force that is tangential to the radius what does that mean? It means perpendicular to the path of the, of the crank arm. So the tangent is always a straight line. You could put anywhere on the circle that would be perpendicular. This is our center point. It would be perpendicular a 90 degree, 90 degree angle. At this point in the pedal stroke, your objective is to push like that. At this point in the pedal stroke, your objective is to push like that. So that means when the crank is here, just past 12 o'clock, right? We start by pushing slightly. We, we push forward and down. Then as you get further towards three o'clock, you're pushing down. And then at the bottom, you're starting to pull back. You can't really do that when you're out of the saddle because your, your pelvis is more forward because it has to be forward enough to clear the saddle behind your thighs, right? Because you're gonna rock the bike. <clears throat> if you have really good ankle mobility though, and you practice this a lot, you kind of can. You kind of can but that's, it's more advanced. But the point is the emphasis of the stroke should be applying tangential force through the entire power phase as much as possible. So that's, that's your connection point to think about it. What most people do is this. <laughs> Some of that, now a lot of this, and they do it stair, late. Stair they start master. late, that's the stair master. So they wait until three o'clock to begin the work phase. Mm -hmm and they're missing 50% of the potential power phase. Humans are really good at pushing down, but whether you're seated or standing, what happens, pop quiz, at the top of the phase, what is required for you to begin the power phase early? If I'm here, my pelvis is tucked, what's required for me to rotate my pelvis forward? Flexible. Uh... Right. Exactly. The mobility to be able to have an acute hip angle. So that's why day one was on hip mobility and how important and fundamental that is. <coughs> if your pelvis is locked in a posterior position, then you're gonna have a harder time delivering that power here with glute. People, right? don't, people don't understand this, but this is why strength training for specifically for cycling is so important, right? Like you, there's so many free watts there for 99% of people that ride bikes. It would just change the whole game. All right, so we're breaking down Charles's standing body position. Let's dive into it. So, this is at a pretty non-intense moment of the ride. So his position and his technique here should be perfect. I think we are riding tempo at this moment. Um, what, let's break it down into three sections. So let's first look at his hands, the position of his hands and his arms, his elbows. Um, there's a couple of segments here where he's got it pretty close. His elbows could get slightly more bent. And that what that would do is that would allow him to uh, get a little bit better leverage on the handlebar and get his front end of his body a little bit lower more aerodynamic on the front end of the bike, but also allow himself to get more leverage. Then if we break it down, we go a little bit further back, we go down to his hips. His hips could go a little bit further back and he could actually raise his hips up a little bit. That would allow him to uh, start to drop his body weight into his pedal stroke a little bit sooner. Um, if you see here, he's not dropping his weight in until after almost three o'clock on the on, on the uh, on the clock there. So that's a little bit late. I'd like to see his body weight being dropped in around, you know, one or, or two at the latest. So he can definitely improve his efficiency there. He's not pressing down as much as most riders do into the pedal stroke, which is actually a good thing. We wanna see you dropping your body weight into that pedal stroke, which will allow you to 
uh, use your use your body weight to get free watts. So he could definitely improve that, but overall not bad. Um, if we look at his uh, his his pedal stroke actually down to his feet, he's got an all right you know downstroke. He could get a little bit better flick of the wrist, you would call it, but a little bit better snap at the bottom of that pedal stroke uh, with his feet as well. So overall, I give him a six out of ten on his technique here. Uh, key tips would be get a little bit lower on the front end, uh, get those that pelvis up uh, a little bit higher, a little bit further back, and drop that body weight a little bit sooner, and you know snap those feet over at the bottom of that pedal stroke. Allow your you know kind of foot to dorsal flexion at the top, so you can start dropping your body weight in, and you know snapping the power down on the downstroke. So yeah, overall pretty good. Six out of ten. Keep working, Charles. We can see your front wheel sort of snaking across the road. Uh, we can tell that because of the position relative to the white line. And what this tells me is that when you're pulling on the bike, the total of the force you're making, the bike is pivoting left to right. It's rocking left to right, but it's not pivoting at the tire point or the tire contact point with the road. It's pivoting somewhere higher than that, probably somewhere closer to the bottom bracket or maybe even the front axle. So when the front wheel is sneaking across the road, you're adding distance to your climb. You know, if you went up a 5K climb and you rode back and forth the entire time, uh, you know, even if it's only 30 centimeters left and right or something like that, and compared that to riding up the 5K climb dead straight, I don't know what the gap would be. You'd have to do the physics on it or figure it out to do the math, but I'm sure it would be significant. So when we're out of the saddle, ultimately we want to modify our technique to have two ideas. One is that the head and shoulders don't really move too much. The bike rocks under you, but the head and shoulders are quiet. And two is that the bike doesn't sneak down the road. And that brings me to my second point. We can see that your head and shoulders are bobbing a fair amount, not a ton, but they're definitely moving. So what we want to work on is having you rock the bike under you. In order to do that, you've got to have a little, probably a little more smoothness to your pedal stroke. The third observation I have is that, especially in the real time, we can see the bike is sort of surging forward with each power phase or at each power stroke. And so what that tells me is we need a little more smoothness to your pedal stroke. Eliminating the choppiness or the pointiness of the pedal stroke isn't the ultimate goal, but we can't have it be too spiky because when the pedal stroke is too spiky, meaning there's too much of a peak during the power phase, then what happens is we get an outcome where the bike accelerates too much during each pedal stroke because then the inverse of that happens and it decelerates also during each pedal stroke. So the bike is sort of seesawing its way up the hill, we might say, right? It's like accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. And we don't want to ride that way because we're just accelerating the bike multiple times in one climb. So these are the little bits I see as far as uh, areas to improve. I can see you've got your elbows bent. That's good. Uh, it looks like you're starting to let your weight fall at the bottom of the stroke, which is great. We can tell that because at about four o'clock, maybe five, the knee starts or rather the knee stops flexing, uh, excuse me, extending. So when you come over the top of the stroke, what happens is the knee extends. And what we want is a straighter knee earlier in the stroke because that tells you you're letting, that tells us you're letting your weight drive the pedal rather than you pushing down with the quad. There's some of both and the harder you go, the more you push with the quads. Uh, but, and at this speed, it looked like you were going pretty fast, but you weren't flat out. I don't know. It's, it's a bit hard to tell in the slow-mo, but ultimately to like when Zach was talking about saving if, uh, energy on the climb, what he means by that is when you get to the top of the stroke, the leg becomes straight and then your weight just falls on the straight leg. That's what he means when he's saying that we want to save energy on the climb and use our body weight to drive the bike. If the knee is extending as the foot drops, then we know that you're pushing, right? Or that you have to at least hold muscle tension. So this is something that uh, it's an impossible goal to have the knee be, you know, 
the same angle the whole way during the power phase. Um, I don't think you could get your hips high enough to do that, or at least most riders couldn't, um, but it's something to strive towards. So as someone who's probably done quite a bit of speed skating in your life, you probably have a, a basic drive to want to, to really push in the bike with your quads. And some of this will be um, learning or unlearning to drive the bike that way and learning to just let your weight fall on the pedal. That's how I would describe it. Zach, I think I just had the biggest life realization. What's happening? I think I, I finally understand I've been riding my bike wrong this whole time. Really? And it's, it's these two. Okay. Those two fingers? You know what I just realized? These two here? I expect them coming. When going, when climbing? Oh, you didn't know that? I just realized on this last yeah. little kicker. Yeah, so here, I'll show you guys real quick. Hand, two fingers like this, thumb over top. To pull when climbing. Yeah. When I, I think I've been pushing, forcing against the pavement with my arms all this time. Too much swift riding. You gotta ride outside to figure out stuff. So out. yeah, the, these two yeah. pull up while being out of the saddle. What I was trying to say is basically when I was standing out of the saddle, I was pushing down on my hoods left, right rather than pulling up from my hoods left, right. Big difference that we're gonna see on day five. Let's go with as the last climb of the day. You got this. Oh man, we can climb anymore. <laughs> right, way back building your jail for team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is Jonathan Vauters, AKA JV the founder and CEO of Team EF Pro Cycling. JV gave us this exclusive seminar that I did not film because there was too much good stuff around, all from his early pro cycling days back in the 2000s, all the way to running a professional team right now, dealing with the UCI, sharing stories with the riders, all of this good stuff just cannot come on the internet. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge with us, JV, and thanks for having me at the Team EF Coaching Camp. So tomorrow, we're heading out to the penultimate climb of the week. I absolutely cannot wait to do a PR up this climb and see how far if I improve. Time to go to sleep. I'm tired as hell. This bike's not over, and the last day, we get to ride with the pros. So that'll be exciting. All right, see you tomorrow. Coming up next in episode number five. Today, we're doing the DTP again. You'll be able to apply better technique to it hopefully execute a better effort. I feel that with the new climbing technique that I've kind of like developed yesterday, I really want to put that into application. Ah, 400! I don't want to go, but... Oh yeah, you're gonna be such a climbing. Dude! I'm not doing another five! Dude! <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Thanks for the ride! I'm back dude! You made me do it! How'd it go? I, I think at the end of the climb I probably said 25 times <laughs> Zach! <laughs> Zach! <laughs> you love me baby, you love me. Oh, f*** you Zach. 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 These are the general recommendations that we have. So 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight for sedentary individuals. Most of the riders will be eating around two to two and a half grams per kilogram body weight.